So this is going to be a podcast with a difference, having a chat with Michael Boyle, uh, formerly known as Michael O'Boyle, but it was our friend Peter Lactos that actually put me in touch. And he says, you have to have a chat with Michael. And Michael, I did a little bit of Googling on you. Just I was curious, you know, in the whole realm of strength and conditioning, you're, you're well up there. <laughs> and uh, I, have the, I have the gift of longevity, if, any, if anything else. Yeah, with a gift of experience as well. So just for strength and conditioning, anybody who doesn't know, and of course, we're joined with, with um, Daniel Paulson from Sweden as well, Oxygen Advantage. And just tying back in, strength and conditioning, we hear the word all over the place. What What is it? How did you get into it, by the way? And what have you seen since the 1990s? Because I believe you, you began in the mid 90s. I actually began in the early 80s, believe it or not. This is my wow. 40th year coaching. I started at the college level as a strength and conditioning coach in, I believe, 1983. So I've seen a lot. I started when I started. It really wasn't even a field where you could get a job. It was sort of a pipe dream for people like me. And I think like everybody, I always say I started like everybody. I think I was lifting weights because I wanted to be bigger and stronger for American football. And I wanted to look better for girls, all the, all the basic stuff that everybody begins with. And then I was very, very lucky. I went to Springfield College, which if any of your listeners are familiar, is a really good physical education school in the United States. And at that time, I studied athletic training because strength and conditioning didn't really want to, it didn't exist. And I knew I wanted to be in the sports world some way, but I also knew I didn't want to be a coach. My dad was a coach uh, and then eventually a school administrator, principal, that kind of stuff. And I, I didn't think I wanted to coach any individual sport. And I thought athletic training might be a good route to go. I did that through college. And then I went to Boston University and got hired as a strength and conditioning coach or as an athletic trainer, excuse me. And I did it for a half a year. And I realized I had a couple of friends who had gotten jobs in strength and conditioning. And I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to do strength and conditioning. So I quit my job and I went to work as a bartender. And I appointed myself the volunteer strength and conditioning coach. So I started in probably 84 at Boston University as a volunteer strength and conditioning coach. And I actually, um, I tweeted out the other day, I forget what it was in response to, but I said at 30, I was able to stop bartending and take a, a relatively speaking full-time job as a strength and conditioning coach. But the first almost 10 years that I did it, my primary income was bars. I worked lots of nice Irish bars. I worked at the, no, the Purple no doubt. Bar, which was a, a legendary Irish bar that's no longer there in Boston. So I'm a huge Irish music fan, and uh, I've been in, in the Irish bar business for a long time. So I have uh, plenty of ties to the, the old country. And your your name as well, is it just once I see the, the name Boyle, it always stands out, you know? So yep. it, there's no hiding from that one. So yeah, we'll claim you as, <laughs> as one of ours. <laughs> Absolutely. As I said, we were O'Boyles originally. And the, the story was that we dropped the O because the, the all the uh, welfare stuff was alphabetical. So everybody prior to O dropped the O. So if you nice. look over, you'll see lots of people early on in the alphabet, Doyles and Boyles and people like that who all dropped the O. And then people like Sullivan's and State O'Sullivan because they were, uh, it didn't benefit them. That was the, that was my grandfather's story anyway. So we'll, well, we don't know if it's true or not. Let's stick with that. Good stuff. So it's kind of interesting because the I understand what strength is, but it, the word conditioning, what does that mean? Well, it's interesting because we started out, we were, it's funny. So for me, I initially was the weights guy. And then eventually we became the strength coach. And then what happened is we did such a bad job with conditioning in general from a sports standpoint that people in my field started to realize gee, I need to take over conditioning too because the coaches, the sport coaches were so far behind because the, the U.S. is, and I think Ireland's probably similar, whereas Sweden is not similar. But in the U.S., sport coaches generally do not have to be trained to be sport coaches. They tend to be ex-players. So we get a lot of this is the way I did it when I played type of people. So uh, now when I think we started out, I mean, we were doing – Cooper test with American football. When I first got started in this thing, we had 300 pound guys running mile and a half runs and we were telling them they were out of shape because they couldn't break 12 minutes. I mean, we did just absolutely absurd things 
So we became strength and conditioning coaches. And then I always think my, my buddy, Mark Verstegen gets credit for, we then became performance enhancement specialists. So we've, we've moved along this continuum. I still think strength and conditioning coach, cause it's simpler, but I mean, it's athlete preparation. That's yeah. really what it is. You're trying to get people more prepared to play their sport. I think I got to be well known in some circles and probably not so well regarded in some circles because I started to put a lot of emphasis on the idea that I thought a big part of preparation was being healthy. And well, I that's think it, huge. Yeah. But in, in the U S it really wasn't Which you, you, you think about it and you say that can't be possible, but we were for a long time, we were training powerlifters or training Olympic lifters, and then hoping that that would transfer over somehow into sport. So, and we still have now, even in the U S there's still a huge number of, of West side people, people who are just fascinated with powerlifting, but who think they're, in the athletic preparation business. And I started saying things like we need to get away from uh, conventional sort of back squat type stuff. We need to stop doing paying power cleans from the floor. We need to start doing core training, which when you, you know, you mentioned breathing, we were just, we, we've, we just started to scratch the surface initially. I would say when I started, you know, you did abs at the end of the workout, you cranked out a hundred sit-ups or something like that. And, and that was, your ab work. And then gradually over time, we started to learn. And obviously the, the folks listening don't know, but you just did an hour session for us yesterday. But what we started to do was start to listen to people like you and listen to people in the respiratory therapy world and say, wait a second, there's way more going on <laughs> than mm -hmm. we thought. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it's the good thing for me. I'm 63. I've been doing it for 40 years. And I'm still learning, which I think is awesome. Yeah. That's, I think, what keeps me excited about the field, keeps me going to work. I'm in, sitting in work uh, right now in our little uh, – we've got a little studio that we use for Zoom classes or mm -hmm. things like that. And I can still get excited about work and about learning 43 years or 40 years later. Yeah, the human body is pretty amazing. And I think the other thing is the more you're in something, the more you realize what you don't know. And you're you're happy enough to say it too. You don't, you don't feel that you have to know everything. Right. And well, that's in, I think that's the biggest part is the, the key. It's like someone like you is a perfect example, right? You find an expert in an area and you listen to that expert. And then you think, okay, like yesterday's session for us, what can I take from that expert that I can easily incorporate into what I'm doing right now? That's mm. the process. And so for me, whether that was, Stuart McGill 15 years ago or somebody like you or whatever it was, it's finding these people who are subject matter experts. And then it, and in my case, you get to know these people. Like I like to say to people now, Hey, I can call Patrick up. I could call him up and he's going to answer my phone call and he's going to give me the answer that I want to know. And people say, Oh, how do you do that? And I'm like, you network sure. a guy like Peter, right? You, you know, Peter, we're doing business with Peter in Hungary. And all of a sudden Peter said, you really got to meet this guy. And suddenly I'm meeting a guy whose book I already read, whose information I'm really familiar with, but who, like I Googled you until I Google you, I'm like, Oh, Galway guy too. And mm. we ended up having a common friend who used to be in Boston. So that's so, so crazy. We were talking about James O'Toole earlier on, and he, he is such a character. If we had him here, in actual fact, we probably wouldn't get a word in edgeway. So exactly, yeah, he's, we, he's better we'd off. To, we'd have to have a mute button, but, um, <laughs> but so how did I think you get that's into... the key to success in this industry is, is the ability to be adaptable and the ability to learn. And I'm not saying we're not there. I mean, there's a lot of things that you're doing that truthfully we're not ready for yet. It's hard. And that's why I loved your session yesterday because my takeaway from the session was if you can just get people doing some nasal breathing, mm -hmm. you've, you've made a really big. Yeah, big totally. Goal. It's something, it's something we've, I have always been bewildered. Why even during a warm up that athletes don't <laughs> breathe through the nose. When you look at the benefits, when you look at it, just normal physiology, you know, and it does add an extra load onto the diaphragm, but also from a, a biochemical dimension. Sometimes I often think, Michael, we would have a client coming in and the person is breathing faster in upper chest. And then you're asking, to, you're saying to yourself, why is that person breathing using the upper chest? They're breathing that way because they feel that they're not getting enough air. So they're breathing upper chest and they're breathing faster to compensate. But then we ask, well, why do they feel they're not getting enough air? Well, their breathing could be off from a biochemical dimension. Now, the problem there is that if we were to focus mainly on them from a biomechanical dimension, 
without addressing the biochemical dimension, we're not going to get a long-term outcome because they will continue to breathe upper chest because they're feeling suffocated or air hunger. This is the human body. Everything is inter interrelated in some degree. Um, not everything, but a lot of functions are. And even with breathing, it's a little bit more complex than what one would first think. Oh, there's no question. I, I think um, one of the things that we realized, and as I said, we're not where you guys are by any stretch of the imagination, but we started looking at core training and realizing for a long time, core training, I say core training kind of went through periods of time. I always say there was like the Australian period, the, the Paul Hodges, like, you know, draw your belly button in. There were all these, what I would consider artificial cues. McGill would tell you, you know, you got to brace, you got to do this. And what we realized, and I, I think it was, I don't know if you know Sue Falcone, but uh, she's uh -huh. a physical therapist. She's somebody you would, you need to meet and you need to have on your podcast. So Sue, I'll just, I'll digress momentarily, was one of the original athletes performance people. And then started working with the Dodgers, became the first female head athletic trainer in Major League Baseball. First hey, female head athletic trainer in professional sport in the United States, actually. Wow. But super nice, super smart. But she used to talk about, she used to say all the time when she do presentations, the diaphragm is my favorite muscle. And I can remember the first time she said it thinking, diaphragm's a muscle? I remember sitting in a thing and going, mm. diaphragm's a muscle. And then I'm thinking, but muscles are things that I think we can train, right? That's the, that's the thing. So you start looking at that um, and you start thinking to yourself, okay, how do I train that muscle? And then you start looking, she started, I remember that she introduced me to another book called Anatomy of Breathing. And she said, you really got to understand this whole um, breathing thing. And then you start realizing. So the thing that what I was getting to is that we realized that your deep abdominal muscles were muscles of end stage exhalation. So when mm -hmm. I'm trying to force all of my air out, when I do that, if I think I'm going to blow out as much air as I possibly can, I need to use my internal oblique. I need to use my transverse abdominus. I need to use my external oblique. Mm -hmm. And we started to realize for us, just if we just cued maximum exhale, we got what we wanted to get from a core training standpoint without saying to somebody, draw your belly button into your spine or, or think about bracing or whatever it was. It was just exhale. So we started using breathing in that way, saying, like our cue with core training is nasal inhale and then hard purse lipped exhale. Mm. So if you get someone to think like blow out as hard as you can, I can get them to now reflexively use the muscles I want them to use without having to try to artificially get them to do something. And we spent a lot of time with people. I mean, trying to make statues probably, I guess, when you looked at it and that was mm. so and then you get into starting to study more. And then I find some of the stuff like that you had been talking about and you realize, wait a second, the nose is a filter and the nose makes nitrous oxide. And you start thinking, and then you start looking kind of at the respiratory therapy world and realizing one of the things I always say to people, this information has been out there for 30, 40, 50 years, but in strength and conditioning, and I, I'll give you, here's my, my standard line and I'll, I'll admit my guilt here. I used to always joke whenever yoga people would ask me about breathing, I'd be like, whatever all my clients are breathing i don't have any that stopped so don't worry about it and that yeah, was how I, I thought like okay everybody's breathing what's the big deal yeah and then realizing like i always tell people now i think i feel so stupid because of the number of times i probably gave somebody that wise ass answer when and, did that change when when, uh, when I yeah. would say probably about 10 years ago when sue first started to talk about it i started to realize wait a second there's more to this yeah, but you've been in contact dance. with breathing a little bit before when you said those belly inhales and stuff like that. So you've you kind of touched on it before, but not really got into it. Right. And that's what, and we still honestly, we're not. I go through yesterday's so talk. We're not where we need to be by any stretch of the imagination. And I know there's a lot of resistance to just nasal breathing. There's a lot of resistance to mouth taping. I think that that's going to take a long time for people to to really understand. And even for me, because. Unfortunately, American sport, American football, I've probably had two or three broken noses. I'm not a great. That's why I loved your uh, your decongesting thing yesterday, because there are some times when I'm trying to to breathe, you know, and do specific breathing practice that I can't because I'm I can't get my nose to work. I used to think my nose would never work. I used to think, you know, I'm never going to be able to breathe through my nose. And now I can't. Yeah, yeah. it's and not a or and I because I studied the uh, Pateco. Is that the correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I started to study that 
and probably through your book, I forget what initially, it was either you or Mercola that I initially mm. saw that technique from. And I started doing it. And the thing that I found for me that's amazing is that the way it helps me sleep. Like I'm a napper. Yeah. I love to take naps during the day. And I can literally breathe myself to sleep with two or three minutes of yeah. really focused nasal breathing. Yeah. And Michael, I think- I'll step in. Uh, for me, the sleep was the one thing that got, I, that's how I got involved with this. Chronic mouth breathing, waking up feeling tired, concentration is not good, but also recovery and stress isn't good. Now, there's a couple of aspects here. Number one is American footballers are more prone to obstructive sleep apnea. And I would guarantee you that at least 50% of them are breathing through an open mouth during sleep. The second thing is concussion. There are even breath hold exercises that one can be using to help improve blood flow in the brain post-concussion. And this was identified in 2016 with a group of athletes that post-concussion blood flow in the brain is reduced. Now that has to have an impact on brain health by doing small breath holds, very simple, gentle exercise, even going for a jog with the mouth closed, increasing carbon dioxide in the blood is just physiologically, it's a vasodilator. It will improve blood flow to the brain. We should be kind of looking at breathing outside of this isn't about yoga breathing, nothing got to do with yoga breathing whatsoever. It's just really about looking at What's the physiology and the science and what can we do with it with the understanding that we know now? And I know Daniel is just dying to jump in, so I better stop talking. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering because you said we don't, we're not where we're supposed to be, but is there a difference, like Patrick now mentioned football, whether you coach somebody in, in for basketball, football, because you got your own community, but you're coaching other sports. So do you see a difference in, in who you're coaching, soccer, tennis, hockey? or there, no, is, I think... In general, we have, I would say our our elite athletes here are extremely unaware of breathing and that it's a really hard sell. It's difficult to get people because we started playing around with some of this, trying to do nasal breathing for recovery during interval training and showing people, okay, if you sit and you focus on nasal breathing, your heart rate, because we have heart rate monitors, like your heart rate will drop faster. And people are shocked by it but they don't consistently keep doing it. So I think there's some uh, there's some transferability that we're missing, I think, in terms of how do we get this in. And that's why when you said before we started, if I have questions. So I know you had said short breath holds. Americans by nature, American sport, it's very competitive. I started thinking, should we have contests to see who can hold their breath the longest? Is there benefit to that or is it does it make things worse? But breath holds are a stressor, you know, like any stressor, we always have to, like there is a breathing technique, the Wim Hof method, which is circle the world, hyperventilation and long breath hold. It's a major stressor. I'm not always sure about stressing. I've seen plenty of mistakes happening as a result of stressing people. I've put people into panic attacks. I put one guy into accident and emergency. So I always feel that we have to, to tailor breathing exercise. Yes, stress them. But I don't want to overtrain anybody when it comes to breathing. Like if you think of it this way, if you did an outright sprint at maximum intensity, your blood oxygen saturation with mouth breathing is going to drop maybe down to about 93%. With nose breathing, which it will be excruciatingly difficult because of the air hunger, blood oxygen saturation drops down to about 91%. If we put a pulse oximeter on your, your people yesterday, some of them will have dropped down to 85%. And that's what we can do with breathing, you know, and there's some techniques that are dropping blood oxygen saturation down into 70s. You get disoriented 60. There's a risk of passing out. We don't want to go there. So my whole thing about it is I want to cause a stress, but it's a very controlled stress and it gets adaptations to improve the buffering capacity. And there's a psychological thing about this as well, Michael, you're putting people into an oxygen debt. It's not really well, to some degree it is, but it's also increased carbon dioxide. So it's hypoxic, hypercapnic. It generates quite a strong feeling of air hunger. It's almost that you're, you're changing the perception of breathlessness, that you're pushing out the boundaries. And in one study that was conducted with 21 elite rugby union players in Australia, they got them to do 40 meter sprints using breath holding over four weeks. And it was eight sets of five reps or five, six reps over four re- weeks. Not a whole lot. Their repeated sprintability increased from nine reps to 14.8 reps within the four weeks. And that's with elite level athletes, professional, highly trained during peak competitive season. 
See, the thing is, breathing to this degree hasn't been put into practice. It has been in some pockets. Like I'm working with a world fighter now. He's got a world title coming up in about a week. Well, it's the 10th of December. So yeah, in about 17 days or so. And all he wants is, I said, what's the, what's the one thing you want out of this? He said, I want to get 1% better. And I think we can do that because this hasn't been tapped into to date. And it's not just about the idea of taking these full big breaths. As I said, you know, this idea was only happened around the 1880s and come into the field of yoga. And it, it's almost that it swept the world that the more air you breathe, the better. No, no, no. This is where conditioning comes in. How can we condition the athlete to do more physical exercise with less ventilation? Because then there's an, an economical saving in it. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 super interesting, like I said, to me. Um, but even recovery position, that's another great, like when you think about trying to get guys, your know, hands on knees. In the U.S., we even, we yell at people. We still, I had someone the other day, because we stopped when we realized kind of about, uh, you know, diaphragm positioning and realizing, okay, you breathe better bent over. And there were people in the U.S. who said, no, I would rather have my guys recover worse and stand up straight and have their hands not on their knees and not look weak for the opponent, then recover better. And I looked and said, you'd, you'd rather have a less recovered athlete because you think it looks mentally tougher. But that's that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with in the U.S., which is it's a change here. As much as people think we're progressive, I think change comes really, really slowly here because people are so incredibly resistant Oh, I think they're resistant here as well. I think it's going to be everywhere in the Western world. But it's amazing how things are catching eye. I see it with our own work. It's interest in the last four years has been phenomenal. And the first 20 years, like I'm 20 years at this, it was slow for 16 years. Four years now, it's taken off. You know, so something is happening. I think, Pat, one thing is that all these biometric devices, such as the whoop strap, uh, yeah. or so, are making... Uh, breathing visible, especially if you're recovery. So you can actually see what's going on. Because if you lift weights or, or you're in an ice bath, you, you have something visually. If you get that response, at least you see something is triggered. So all this, all these biometric devices, and especially for recovery, if you isolate that, you see that your recovery is, is being, you know, getting better. From there, you can maybe go to do what you can do before and during. So like, like you said, slow, I mean, change is always slow. But seeing for yourself, I think, is the way people change. And it's coming more and more. So I think that is actually one thing that is helping breathing out. And so I apologize. Danny, my lights, we get lights on a timer in here. And I'm like, oh, you're, you're fine. You're not, you'll have to be waving, you your, you're waving your hand around. There you go. I yeah. am. I had to get up and move. That must have been, it must mean I've been in here 30 minutes. Sorry. Uh, time flies when you're having fun. But do you, maybe things always go by too quick for me. Maybe Daniel and Michael, maybe there's another thing. Maybe recovery wasn't really taken into consideration, Michael, for many yeah, years. Yeah. And is it more oh, taken into consideration? We were so work oriented that rest, you know, trying to get people just to rest, trying to introduce interval training, introduce the concept of work to rest ratio took time. As I said, we were very uh, here initially when I first started the focus was very aerobic. The focus was very physiologist driven. I just wrote an article about um, training for ice hockey. And when I first started, we had people who were saying, you know, 45 minute bike rides, get a better aerobic system. That's the key to better ice hockey performance. And we started talking about interval training and rest to work ratio. So I do think all this stuff, but now it's sort of how are we going to rest and what are we going to do while we're resting is probably the next frontier. And I know that, as I said, for us, it's really difficult when you're going to say, okay, we're going to try to reteach something. And nasal breathing is a reteaching process because we absolutely, we're air suckers. <gasps> and it's the natural reaction to high intensity work. And so to get somebody, even for me, when I get slowed down enough, I think, okay, nasal thing try to get it in through my nose but initially it's like get just get it in because mm -hmm. that's and what you realize actually is that even, that's not even what you're trying to do you really should probably be trying to get it out but it's uh it's 
we're just, as I said, I think we're just way behind, but the fact that we're having this conversation that me as a strength and conditioning coach with 40 years in is having a conversation with you guys as breathing experts is going to help move this whole idea forward because it's going to make more people scratch their head and think, wow, I need to look at this more closely. You think that mm -hmm. if you, if you approach recovery, like you did training, like you can, you can squat uh, two times a certain weight, your PR is this, if you, put focus on recovery and measuring stuff and measure progress in equal on equal footing that you would you would you would actually improve because you always you always think about how you can improve a certain weight but you don't think about how can I improve my recovery so I can become better at lifting weights or whatever your sport is yeah and I think we we've started to do that but I think it's more with post-workout foam rolling post-workout nutrition post-workout <clears throat> Uh, yep. stretching that type of stuff but I don't think there's been enough it's sort of that insertion of our and we have some coaches doing it one of our one of our guys who's up at uh, Merrimack College they do breathing work post-workout they'll go and go legs up on the wall and they'll have a period okay we're just going to spend two or three minutes post-workout doing some nasal breathing so there definitely are coaches that are getting there the one thing that you need, I feel like I could do this much better now if I was back in the college of, well, college really, because college is very much a captive audience and you can just tell them what to do. Whereas mm -hmm. now, like with us, private sector, not that way. When I was in the pro sports world, not that way. There's much more selling in our business, mm -hmm. which makes it more difficult to, to create change, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, you, you mentioned Stuart McGill there and I remember reading one if I remember it off the top of my head he was talking about core and he said there's an idea that's reached trainers out there that core is all about strengthening the abs but he said there's no science behind that that you have to think of the core the inner core, the outer core you have to consider the dive from the pelvic floor the abs and the muscles to the back in other words it's a box mm -hmm. And do you think is that still the idea out there in the general public world that the core is simply the the training the abs and not taking into consideration the diaphragm? It well, it's interesting because now we're going to there. There's a bunch of people who are saying none of this stuff makes any sense, and now they're telling everybody to flex their spine and to do Jefferson curls and to do so. Now it's very much back to sort of a spinal mobility kind of thing. I, I think. There was clearly a swing towards stability, which came primarily from Hodges and then eventually McGill and those guys. And um, they they made a lot of progress in core training. We started thinking about uh, this. One of my favorite books is uh, called Mechanical Low Back Pain because it was the first time that I saw words like anti-extension and anti-rotation. And I think in the last, let's say, 15 years, we've gotten a newfound understanding of what these core muscles actually do and how they actually work. I think we thought of them initially as movers. And so we did crunches and sit-ups and we thought of basically abs were trunk flexors and we did lots of trunk flexion. Then we realized that they were stabilizers. Then we realized, either at least for us, then we realized, wait a second, they're stabilizers, but they're also they're linked to other things. Like I said, end stage exhalation. One of the things you realize we've always said, if we can get people, we'll have people with, you know, neck pain and headaches and things like that. And they're your, like you said, your chest breathers because your, your traps and your scalenes and sternocleidomastoid, they're also accessory breathing muscles. muscles. So if you get someone who's struggling to breathe, they're going to, you know, that chest breathing is literally going to be the up and down is going to come from scalenes and sternocleidomastoid and uh, you know, trap and levator scapulae and all these things. And that person's carbon going to be the person who also, you know, can't move their head, complains of headaches, those types of things. And so we always just talk about trying to get them to think about moving, breathing down. All right. And then you got other people saying, no, it's not diaphragmatic breathing. Don't belly breathe. So I still think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of inconsistency in terms mm. of what people are teaching and what I'm always trying to do is be more integrative. That's why I said yesterday, the big thing that I took away 
was, hey, if I can just get some nasal breathing going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That's that's step one. That's mm -hmm. moving a lot of people. So with the knowledge that you have right mm -hmm. now, what? how would you approach uh, a regular training session? Uh, if you say before, would you would you try to incorporate a few minutes of, of nasal breathing or some breath holes and also during and after just for awareness and slowly build it up or what's that's, your... That's funny that you say, because that's what I'm thinking about. Like, what would I do? Because right now I have a lot of younger kids. I have my son and his friends who are 17, 18 years old. They're a rough audience in terms of trying to get them to settle down and do really focused tasks is very, very difficult. And so I, that's why I was thinking about they do really well with breath holding contests <laughs> because yes. it's something yep. that you could, you know, you could have winners and losers and they could play with. So the, I, those are the things that go around in my mind. That's why I was asking you, Hey, is this not safe? Because I look at it. I remember I was a swimmer as a kid. And at one point I could swim 50 yards underwater. Mm -hmm. Now I can't swim 25 yards underwater. I can't get from one end of the pool to the other underwater. And I used to be able to go down, turn, come back. I never thought about that mm -hmm. as like a CO2 tolerance thing. That never occurred to me that that's what I was developing when I was trying to do this. It just was something that they made us do in swimming. And yep. what they found is the better people could cover 50 yards or 50 meters or whatever it was. Uh, and the people that weren't <clears throat> in as good a condition couldn't. So um, that's what I'm, I guess what I'm struggling with now. And that's what I would be saying to you guys, Hey, what could I do with, looking at it and saying, okay, you've got an audience that's not going to be super attentive to the details, to the little things. How do I incorporate? Like even for our guys, like I tell them all the time, I, and this, you guys will, this is incredibly probably, you'll be like, oh God, this is what he's teaching. But I tell people, I want you to breathe in as hard as you can through your nose because I want them to use their nose. And I tell them, I want you to breathe in like you're trying to suck the snots back in. You know, you're not blowing them out. You're sucking them back into your head. And then I want you to blow out as like you're blowing out candles at my birthday cake. I said, I want you to blow out pursed lips like you're trying to knock out 60 candles because I really want them to get the feeling of in and out mm -hmm. because I think that's the essence of what we want to have happen. And once they understand that part, then it's easier. I, it's easier to moderate it than it is to get it to be really volitional. At least that's yeah. how it works in my head. And you guys analyze that if you're money if I'm I an think, idiot then money, I think I think my, I think for for young kids it's a little bit different but if you're 18 or 19 you can compete in recovery times as well so you can put after a hard workout how fast can you recover your heart rate like say in one minute in five minutes so you can actually compete on recovery because they need that competition so it's not because if you focus on just max uh, breath holes again it's stressors only but if you put focus again on how can you optimize your recovery and, and, and try to do that as good as possible, then you put emphasis on something else that could work as well, because then it's still competition, but it's downregulating. Mm. So that's something I do because it's still, and it's, that's the name of the game. How fast can you recover in soccer or tennis or hockey in between when you're active in the game? If you can recover really fast, you will have a competitive advantage over time towards your, and also in practice. So I think that's equally important to kind of, yeah, compete in recovery. And that's mm -hmm. usually forgotten. It's something you do on the, uh, like a little bit, like, okay, you have a few minutes, let's do that. You've, you've trained for two hours, let's recover for a few minutes. But if you, if you kind of shift that ratio a little bit, then you put emphasis on this as well. Yeah, the words that we use are very important. Yeah. You know, 18 and 90 years of age, 19 years of age, it's almost as if their their mobile phone, their cell phone is part of them. And it's a detriment. And it's a detriment in terms of lack of focus. And really, we need to be, it's not just about physical training. Conditioning also should be about mental training. Have these kids been even taught how to concentrate? And I don't mean necessarily just holding your attention to your breath, but I mean by changing your physiology to be able to bring the autonomic nervous system into balance. So this would be about recovery. And accessing flow states how many of them are playing games and towards the latter end of the game they're getting physical fatigue they're getting mental fatigue their mind is all over the place we have to think of the person as not just how are you performing when you're out on the field we have to think of 
how you're performing off the field is going to influence how you're performing on the field. If you're practicing distraction all day long, you're going to be distracted on the field. And the one thing about these tools are, Michael, if you learn these tools as an 18 year old, you'll have them for the rest of your life because a distracted mind is an anxious mind and a distracted mind. They're not able to cope with situations. The mind is all over the place. Concentration is impacted. So then we have to ask the question, this is conditioning. It's going beyond conditioning. But at the same time, if you have really good attention and you're able to access that flow state, you're more alive when you're out in the field. You're less prone to injury. Fatigue is going to contribute to injury. So then we have to bring in sleep. We have to bring in breathing, functional breathing, recovery, everything what Daniel was talking about. Yes, there's the stressor exercise as well. I think this is about making the individual more rounded. Now, I've spoken, I remember I was working with a couple of athletes and I was talking, I think, I know, Daniel, if you were on the same call, but I was talking about pre-match anxiety and I got total pushback. And I said, oh, it's, we don't have pre-match anxiety. And, you know, many athletes have pre-match anxiety. You've got youngsters going out into high pressure environments. Have they been taught how to change their physiology to deal with that? Like some of the people we work with, we work with snipers and I've been brought in to work with elite snipers, to teach them how to breathe while pulling the trigger of a gun. I think part of this is that we need to make breathing sexy. We need to make it. And it has been, that's why I often said, it has been under the custodians of the lads and the and the, the women with the beads and the, the robes and the open sandals and all of that nonsense. There's nothing, for me, breathing is the ability that if I'm to go into a difficult situation, I'm able to regulate my state that I can hold my attention in that. And the measure of a leader out there on a football field or any field is the person who is able to remain calm and collected when things are not going right. This is mental training just as much as breathing training. Yeah, no, I really have, I realize to, we have a test here. We can do, like you said, with the cell phones, like people mm. is attached to you. Like I think for young kids, uh, if you're 18 or 19, if you sit on a cell phone and you flip through whatever you flip through for five minutes, you have somebody else doing slow breathing or breathe light, whatever they want to do, and then have a workout or something they need to focus on right after. Because then you bring in something from their world into what you can do as an alternative for focus and also lower your heart rate so you can perform better. That is, I think, then you make them aware that this is how it affects you because it does affect this distraction and in turn heart rate and in, in turn focus and performance. But if you give that to them as a tool, you can have groups and you can alternate. So I just realized that's what I will do because you can't tell them no, that's, they will just, <laughs> so instead have, have them try it. That's exactly because what, what we're dealing with too is we've got a huge um, energy drink problem over here in terms of, yeah. I don't know if you guys have seen the same yeah. thing, yeah. but. It's a it's like a billion dollar industry in the U.S. So we've got the combination of kids who are on their phones all the time, ingesting large amounts of caffeine, ingesting pre-workout type supplements. And then it, in a lot of cases, anxiety medication. It, it, you know, mm -hmm. there's kids I know my son has friends, high school friends who are you know already medicated for anxiety and depression at 17 years of age. Yeah. So. There's a lot of variables that we're playing with and it's not, yes. it's, it's interesting. I'm kind of sitting here thinking, okay, how am I going to do this? I may experiment. I got a group coming in at one o'clock today and I may experiment a little bit with this today and say, all right, can I get them to do a little bit of focused nasal breathing, but just getting these guys to focus period. Yeah. Really, really difficult. It's like, you know, come on, let's go pay attention. Yeah. But I think Michael, you're right. Just to start with that. Yeah. And just going for a walk, blocking one nostril. You know, even if you block the right nostril to breathe through the left, it has a calming effect anyway, but you're doing it to create that feeling of suffocation. Like sometimes when I'm working with people, I remember I was working with a bunch of bunch of alpha, really strong individuals. They were males. And I said, they're not going to believe what I'm going to say about breathing here. So I got them doing pretty challenging stuff. And I got them starting off with jogging and then running with the mouth closed and they were feeling it. Then I got them doing breath holds. Then I put on, we have a mask, we use sports mask. I had them use that. I wanted them to, I wanted them to feel a bit of pain just to show them that there's a bit, there's something in this. So, but I would agree with you in terms of 18 and 19 year olds, you're starting off 
getting them walking with the mouth closed, getting them to be more self-aware, going into jogging, going into faster jogging, bring in a few small breath holds as well. You'll be safe enough if you say, now that you're jogging, I want you to breathe in and out and hold your breath for 10 to 15 paces. You'll never do any harm there because it's controlled. Now they'll feel the air hunger. And then you're saying, okay, let's do it again for 10 to 15 paces. And then a minute later, you could increase it to 20 paces, but say to people, listen, I want to challenge you, but I don't want to push you over the top. This is a stressor. And I want you to dip your toe into the water because I think the last thing we want to do is to push it to the extreme that it puts people off. But um, by doing it that way, and you're talking about the benefits, if you have stuffy nose, it helps open up your nose. It's opening up your blood. It's opening up blood flow to the brain, for example. It's opening up your airways. It's helping to drive your focus. And this is the stuff. Yeah, it's kind of, I think the language we use is, is a key that we have to think, but we, you know, okay, we're quite a long way from 18 years of age, but we were there once. We can still remember it. And we can get we can bring it back to their level, you know. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I mean, eighteen years old. I I I know I wasn't a very good listener. That's for sure. I did. <laughs> we, had, we had other things on our mind at eighteen. Yes, <laughs> a lot, of, made a lot, of, a lot of dumb things. It has to be relevant for these kids, and and uh, th this is always the issue. I can just relate to myself. If somebody came to me when I was eighteen, it would not have worked, most likely. So knowing that there needs to be, but I think you can reach anyone if you make it relevant, that's, that's the key. And if you're in whatever sport, if you see an improvement, you feel it, then at least you know there's something there. It may not happen immediately, but over time, one year later, two years later, it will happen at some stage. So um, I think it's, it's coming, like you said, Patrick, it's, it's uh, uh, coming, uh, but change is, is always, uh, pretty slow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 no it's good so what do you do for uh, for recovery in terms of before breeding what what are your tools we, for no, honestly we, we we don't we don't do enough we don't i don't know if we really like with the groups that i have now we probably don't do anything because we don't really have them post game and in the, the harsh reality is in a private business you know, when they're done, we kind of want to get them out of the way. Mm -hmm. So you don't really have that time to think, hey, if we had enough space, would I would I like to say to everybody, like I said, uh, my friend Mike Vaughn up at Merrimack is going, you know, okay, everybody, we're just going to get up against the wall, legs up, and just do just two minutes of trying to cycle through. I mean, as I said, just nasal inhale, nasal exhale, or uh, I think – uh, the, the box breathing idea. That's what I play with mm -hmm. in terms of trying to inhale for five, hold for five, exhale for five, hold for five. And do, cause I like that because if I just do fives, three breaths is a minute. So I can realize that if I'm just doing five and I go through that six times or nine times, then I get two or three minutes, mm -hmm. but we don't do enough of that stuff. And that's why I said, I wish now at this stage, I wish I was back in the, um, the collegiate world, because you just have way more control. You can just say, hey, this is what we're going to do. And everybody yeah. does it. <laughs> There's but no, it's, it's like being in the army. Ice baths or anything. Because I know in college, when I was there in the U.S., that was a long time ago. They did uh, ice baths. So that's been around. Do you do any yep. of that? So we did, when I was in college, I haven't been in college for 10 years. But during, we did... We did ice baths, we did contrast, we did post-game flush rides, because we were kind of, um, you know, like Patrick had said, the 1% better. We were looking, particularly because we played a lot of Friday, Saturday. We played almost every Friday, Saturday. So particularly on the Friday game, we were thinking, if anything that we're doing has any impact at all, you know, we'd bring in, we'd have food brought in, we'd have shakes, we would make them ride the bike just for five minutes to, you know, people would say flush ride, and I'd people would be like, flush what? And I'm like, I, I don't know, but I know their legs don't feel good after the game. So if we, you know, if we can get that sort of systemic pump moving, whatever that waste product is, that's there. And you can argue whether it's, you know, hydrogen, hydrogen ion, ion, yeah. lactate, you know, what, whatever you want to theorize that it is, you'll hopefully move it out. And then, you know, we would roll, we would stretch. We'd be really meticulous about that post-game process now. And that's why I wish I had, I, I wish the, my son's coach would give me 
control of that. I tell my son's friends and him all the time. I said, you guys are lucky. I'm not your real coach. He said, because <laughs> I wouldn't be nearly as nice as I am right now in terms of I have to be, I got to be nice because you're all coming here because you want to be here. It's all voluntary. In college, it, there was, it was just, hey, this is what you're going to do. And if and guys what about said, I don't like mm -hmm. it, we were like, oh, we used to say something like, maybe you don't like playing. And so, you what know, about emphasis on sleep as recovery tool? Because I mean, well, the extension, natural extension from sleep is breathing. So if you get to having a sleep coach on college or a pro team, the next step is a breathing coach. Yeah, and we did that when I was with the Red Sox, we did have, we actually brought a sleep expert in, but unfortunately he was a medical doctor and I don't think he was exactly what we needed, but we did at least, you know, for us, we were trying to get just things like we took uh, some junk out of our room and put beds in so that we could have a place for the guys to, to nap. Cause we had guys, we had guys that were making $20 million sleeping on the floor. We were rolling out yoga mats and they were taking naps on the floor of the weight room. And you mm -hmm. look and think, wait a second, you know, we're, this is a billion dollar business and we get guys making $20 million and I got them. He's in the media room sleeping on a yoga mat with a rolled up towel as a pillow. And we were able mm -hmm. to change that, yeah. but still probably not. And again, it's been 10 years, but not at the level that would have been considered perfect, but at a level where you say, okay, this is better. But like for me, I just bought, I don't know if you guys have seen them. I just bought one of these eight sleep mattress covers. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's, I've seen it. yeah. Yeah. it's a, uh, it's got a grid and that's made a really big difference to me. I slept seven hours and 40 minutes last night, which is probably two hours more than my average. And it's strictly based on, I think, one of the things that the eight sleep does is it makes you aware of sleep because mm -hmm. there's an app and you look and think, okay, what was my sleep fitness score? What was my, what was my lowest heart rate during the night? What was it? It's measuring HRV. I have no idea how it's doing it or if it's doing it with any accuracy. I know mine is consistent. I don't know that it's, you know, it's sort of, then you get into validity versus reliability kind of thing, right? Is it, yep. it's definitely reliable. I don't know if it's valid, <laughs> but that type of stuff. But, and like I said, for me, I'm a big, I am a, if I'm having trouble going to sleep, the first thing I will revert to is breathing right yeah. away. And it's amazing. And I always, and you probably see this with your clients. I always have this feeling of, I don't know why I do this. It never works. And then I wake up. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like I go through three minutes of it and think it's not working. And then 30 seconds later, I'm asleep and a couple, you know, whatever, if it's, if I'm napping 20 minutes later, I wake up and think oh, it worked again. Yeah, there's two aspects. If we wake up during the middle of the night, well, first of all, we should be asking the question, why do we wake up? It's really common. It's 30 percent of people have insomnia and 10 percent have it chronically. But the temperature of the bedroom is very important. The temperature of the room. So the room should be cool. And if we're snoring or if we have sleep apnea, which is fairly common, it's between 25 to 50 percent of men. And with women, it's more older women that it affects but getting them out closed. Um, I'm going to show it to you because you talked about taping, Michael. We use this tape. This is my own tape now, and I'll show it to you. You may not have seen it before, and it works with a beard. The blue one does. We stretch it around the lips to bring the lips together. And it's tense. Now, it's kinesio tape that's altered mm -hmm. to pull the lips together. And there's no risk with this. Because every often when people think about taping of the mouth, they think, oh, my God, it's draconian. What am I going to do? Now, the thing is, the one thing, once you start breathing through your nose, it works better anyway. But if you have an individual with nasal congestion, they will typically be breathing upper chest. Because mouth, nose congestion is going to cause mouth breathing. Mouth breathing is engaging the upper chest. But then sleep is lighter as well. I think every facet of that individual is, is affected. But coming back to the 18-year-olds, you know what I'm curious about? If they were asked, what's the one thing that they would like to improve from a sporting point of view, what would they say it is? Is it focus? Is it to be able to run faster? What's the thing that you think that they might hone in on? Yeah, I think it would clearly be something performance related. So mm. whether it was run faster or shoot more accurately or or whatever it was, but I think it would absolutely be a performance factor that they would see. And that's where I think, you know, when you talk about the studies, like Daniel was talking about, you know, if you said to kids, Hey, we're going to do a, a shooting study yeah. and we'll give you 
six shots after you've been looking at your cell phone and six shots after you've been doing some nasal breathing and see what your accuracy level is. Those are the type of things that I think, again, if you're, if you're the sport coach and you can implement that type of stuff, yeah. that's what you're really going to see some difference because if you can tie it very directly to performance, then yeah. everybody's in quick. Yeah. Two it minutes. It seems to me that you, that you have top athletes in all, all walks of uh, all types of sports doing it off and on, but you never really see a, at least to my knowledge, a complete team doing, you know, a full sweep of everything. They know that they have this and this and the whole, the whole nine yards, but, but you, you read about top athletes doing, doing lots of things. So I think sooner or later it will be, you'll, you'll have an organization which just focus on recovery only like it will be so, because that is performance related, but it, I don't know about you and Red Sox and, and other organizations, but or what it's like there right now, if that's, if that's valid, or what do you think? No, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think what happens is you see there are certain guys who are in the I'll do anything, I'll spend anything, kind of the LeBron James yep. sort of thing. And some of them, I think, do it for the attention. I don't know if they necessarily do it because they're that truly focused on it. But that does trickle down because other guys see the money and the time and the energy that they're spending. And they will tend to follow that. And the organizations will too. Like I said, we, with the Red Sox, even this was 2000, I don't know, 12, I guess, 12, 13. But we were able to get them to think, hey, we really, because imagine, but, well, this is the thing. I'm sorry, I'm going back. But imagine baseball coming out of a period where amphetamines were normal. And then suddenly you've got a bunch of guys who amphetamines are normal. And, Ambien is normal, and yet having a place to sleep during the day is abnormal. These are kind of the environments that you're trying to change. Even you know, you look at the Premier League in soccer, and you've got guys just trying to get guys to train. You've got guys who don't weight train. Guys who are like, no, we don't do that. And thinking, wow, and that's again changed drastically in the last ten years in the Premier League. But it's we've got. I guess the point is we've got a really long way to go in a lot of areas. Yeah. So I'm just conscious of time, Michael, because we've taken so much already. You've got a long way to go, but obviously a lot has been done. And where do you see it yourself in terms of, do you see that the, the future athlete is going to be a very well-rounded individual? Do you think, where do you think that there is going to be room for some improvement? Yeah, I think what you're going to see, and Daniel alluded to it, I think you're seeing more you're seeing better monitoring devices. The problem with the monitoring devices, whether it was Whoop or Oura Ring or whatever it is, there were some questions, again, about the reliability and the validity of those types of things. Those things are getting better again. And, uh, you know, so that's going to make a really big difference. You see things like the, um, you know, the eight sleep, the mattress pads, those types of things. I think that's the kind of stuff that's going to make a really, really big difference over time. But it's going to take... The good thing is the organizations now... There's so much money involved that there is incentive because, as you said, the 1% better, that makes a difference. When you look at Major League Baseball in the U.S., it's really interesting in terms of it almost always comes down to the last weekend in terms of who's going to make the playoffs, which is crazy when you think they play 162 games and then suddenly the last one or two games actually matter wow. relative to who's going to get in the playoffs. So it makes, you know, when you look – because the uh, the – the incentive is always financial, whether it's for the players. You look at players and think, hey, one more year, another year contract in Major League Baseball might be $10 million because mm -hmm. you're making you – know, it's very back-end loaded in baseball. And the organizations, the money's all in the playoff games. So you can see more and more teams. Um, so I, I do think there's a lot of incentive there for things like sleep and breathing and nutrition. And we're getting better. Everybody has chefs now. When I first started, nobody – Nobody mm -hmm. had a chef. Guys drank beer. When I first started with the Bruins, guys smoked cigarettes. Guys smoked. Guys drank after the game in the locker room, and guys smoked between periods in the nineties. <laughs> and, and it's so, in the nineties. That's only 90s, that's, yeah. that's not so long ago. Like yeah, so exactly. And and that, that to me, I started there in nineteen ninety with the Bruins. I was there ninety to ninety nine. 
So when you look at that and think, my God, there's been massive change in terms of, but you would look at it and think, yeah, but the change is, you know, the absence of cigarettes and beer is a really positive change, but it is. Mm -hmm. And the idea of even letting guys sleep, you know, in, in hockey, the pregame skate idea, you know, bringing guys in in the morning and then sending them home again to just come back again in the afternoon. I mean, there's, there's some incredibly archaic things in sport that we just do because everybody before them mm -hmm. has done them. Mm -hmm. And I do think we're making some progress in that regard. Yeah, uh, well done. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And no doubt the fact that you're questioning all this is what drives it forward anyway. Well, uh, it's great. I, mean, I appreciate, like I said, I appreciate you yesterday taking an hour with our staff. I appreciate sure. you guys having me on because I, I think the good thing for me is this is really motivating to make me realize, hey, I gotta, I have to push this forward with my athletes more. So I, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity. Pleasure. I'll reach out to James O'Toole as well. I'm going to send oh, him a text please. now in, tell, in a moment. Tell him that I said hello. He's going to laugh. <laughs> he sure will. All right. And Daniel, Mike, nice to meet you. Michael nice Boyle, you. thanks very right. much. Jump thanks. out of here. Thanks. Take care.